Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. I've spoken about this woman uh, to so many people, and her name is Mary Barnes, and she has the title of CEO of Alzheimer's Community Care, but she really has, should have a different kind of a title. It should be the the total advocate for Alzheimer's for for the past 35 years, someone who has put her her soul, her heart out there. And today, life is better for those who have Alzheimer's and their families. And I welcome you to our show, Mary. Hey there. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, Mary. Good. And, you know, it's you should be so proud of yourself, and I know you are. And you work so hard sometimes you never really get a chance to sit back and reflect on who you are and what you've done. <laughs> well, there'll be plenty of time in my life, I'm <laughs> sure, that will be to reflect, but... Right now, it's too exciting. The times are uh, too important. Uh, the need is too great. And uh, it's just like we're at another level, uh, Anita, to really do the kind of work that, we've, that we, I've always tried to do. You know, it's been a, a challenge over these years, uh, since 1985, when I first started getting into the world of Alzheimer's. And there was so little about it uh, that I think there was a paragraph in... Um, some areas of universities and stuff, but now the insurgents. And there is really, really an, um, an, a lot of activity and focus. And I have to say, even on the level of the federal government now, that they're starting to get it, that we have to take care of our caregivers. We know now, unfortunately, that there will not be a cure or there will not be a a medication for a slow down, uh, for slowing the process down for probably another 10 years. And we have our baby boomers out there. So there are ways and there are interventions that for maintaining a quality of life for our families in the community. And that's what everybody's starting to become aware of. We have to shift this focus that's always been on inst- institutionalization. It is not the answer. I'm going to tell you something about the baby boomers. They're not going to go quiet into the night in this. They, uh, they have their, their uh, focus. They have their purpose. They, they, they want to make a difference, too. Even, and, and I'm talking about not only caregivers, but patients as well. And we need to, our job, and this is always, I've always thought, what I knew what we needed to do was to give tools. You can't expect people to have make change and cope unless they have these tools. You're so right. And Mary, I wanted to just go, instead of fast forward, let's go fast backward. Okay, so you're in high school. I don't know. And then talk to us about your early life and why this even became important to you. Well, you know, I've always been in, in um, the world of gerontology. I've never, I've never made a shift. Um, it's just been the way my life has been. And I was very fortunate. I was brought up in, um, in a family. I, I come from Connecticut originally. And uh, I, when I was young, um, the elders of our family and of the family were always very present. I was very lucky to be involved. My mother and father were very, very clannish with family, you know, and... Uh, every holiday we spent with Meme and um, my aunts and uh, my father's uh, sisters. And um, I was very, very lucky that way. And my training, my religious training, was Salvation Army. So in the Army, and I came very close to being an, an officer, very, very close. Huh. And until I found out I couldn't wear makeup or I couldn't <laughs> wear jewelry. <laughs> So when I saw that, I was like, this is not going to work for me. <laughs> but I never, ever forgot the doctrines. I never, ever forgot the, what, what they taught. And, you know, the Army believes, as you see there, very often they have their citadels in very poor areas of every, any community. And it's, God was made in, uh, we were made in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the image of God, okay? We, we, and doing that, if you serve mankind, you're serving God. And that's, that's basically very, very, very simple, okay, as far as identifying what their doctrines meant. And I, and I bought that hook, line, and thinking my father was a very generous man. 
when it came to helping people, even at times in his life at his, at his own health, at expense of his own health. And, um, you know, I know that, that always stuck very strong with me. So that's probably, and, in my, and I was very athletic in my uh, high school years. And um, I, would, I grew up in Coventry in Connecticut, which is by a lake. And my mother and father abandoned Hartford because in the 1950s because it was just, it was getting too risky uh, playing in the parks. So they just decided they wanted to move out to the country, and, and uh, they moved by a lake. And so I used to live on the su- in my summer days uh, in uh, by the lake. And then when I was in 16 and 17 years old, I became a, a counselor at the Salvation Army camp that was right on the lake as well. And I spent my summers uh, being a counselor, and I learned a lot then about so many things uh, with, uh, you know, uh, racial issues, and uh, it was it was uh, it was a very good experience. Okay, so, so now we good. take you. Now you're a counselor. You're you're in your your teens. Then what happened? Then I went in. Then I, for a short time before I got married, and after I got married, I worked for this Aetna. Uh, when I was young, just a little side story. My mother got TB when I was 13 months old. Hmm. And uh, so I had to go someplace. My father had to work. And at that time in uh, Hartford, there was a children's village that was started in West Hartford. And it was done by millionaires. Uh, You know, you didn't have a state. The state government did not give or was not at all involved in welfare or health care and providing services. So it was done by the real, uh, the, the rich of the community. Well... Um, Mr. Brainerd, who started Aetna, founded Aetna, knew my dad and said to, and, and he was this, uh, one of the starters of this children's village, and it took in children that were uh, under, you know, they were so many months old up to, uh, they had like a, it, was, it wasn't called an orphanage, but it was pretty much this, this span of kid, children were there up to their teenage years. And uh, so he heard of my father's need, and he approached my father and said, Ernie, I'll sponsor your baby, you know, he's 13 months old, to go into the children's village. And it was done by the founder, all the other founders of that was, uh, you know, founder of Mr. Kino, founder of Connecticut Bank and Trust, and uh, some big, big, the real travelers, uh, uh, Connecticut General, I mean, it was a big effort. And that, by the way, those buildings still stand to this day (laughs) in West, because they were all made out of brick and everything. So I was there for about until I was five years old, because my mom was very sick with TB. She was lucky. Forty-five women went into, at the same time, into the sanitarium, um, and only five came out, and she was one of them. That's oh, wonderful. Bad, that's how bad uh, TB was at that mm. time. She had two collapsed lungs. But I couldn't go home, so I was brought up very, and it left a very positive impact. I had a Wonderful time. I, I had 35 sisters and brothers. <laughs> and, you know, so when I, when, my, when I went home, my poor mom, I, went, I cried, she said, for weeks because I wanted to go back home. <laughs> so I had it. So, you know, when I tell the story, people say, oh, you know, too bad. No, no, you can't. So I always had a very, but my relatives, my family, the older, my meme, and uh, they all, all felt so sorry for me. Oh, my God, you know, that was there. My father, how can you do this? And they visited every weekend. I mean, they brought over stuff and everything. And even after I got was growing up, anything that happened in my life, Anita, anything, whether it was my high school graduation, my birthday, I always was, uh, they always gave me presents and everything. Because poor Mary, she went through that terrible time early mm-hmm. in her life. So my, my, rel- my older, uh, my aunts and uh, uncles, and I was always, like, treated okay. A little special. I, I think I'm the only one that every time I had a baby, and I had three children, every time I had a baby, they had to throw a shower for me. Now, hello. I mean, come on. You know, you have a shower the first one, but you don't have one every time you have a child. But that's the way it was in my... And so I always grew up with this with this very high regard. And, and, and I'd always thought that my, my, uh, my uh, older relatives were so wise. I always thought that everything that they were... They were dynamite women to begin with. I mean, um, in all honesty, every one of them had got divorced from their husbands, which at the time nobody ever got divorced. <laughs> I mean, they were strong women. 
and uh, they, they they left a very strong uh, mark on, on on my life. So. They also left you, but one thing that keeps coming out, though, they really loved you. You know, you felt love at a oh, very yes. early age. Yes. Always. I was lucky. And that's what comes out now, I think, Mary. Yep. I had so much of a reservoir of that given to me at such an early, such an early, and, and a, such a big impression, mark on my on my uh, psyche that um, it, it led to, people say to me, Mary, because I've been doing this for, you know, as you say, since 1985 for a long time, why, why, do I, why, do, why don't I get burned out? It's because, you know, when you do something that you really believe in, first of all, and you really know that, it's going, that it has to happen, you don't get burned out with that. I know I don't. Uh, it's, it's yeah, you're not. right. No, I think you you have a passion for this, and this is your life. It's like you breathe. Well, this is what you do. But so now you're, you know, now you're you're married. But no one even knew about the word Alzheimer's. What what was your? Where did this come from? Well, when I was up in Connecticut, I was very fortunate. I had a great job um, at the as known to community college. All the colleges up in the community colleges are named after Indians and stuff as known to get in field, Connecticut. And, and I had a, a president that was like a mentor to me. And he gave me an opportunity to be senior citizen uh, program director on a community college campus, which was there was nothing like that in the whole state of Connecticut. And he believed on his campus, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, Dan McLaughlin, he believed that his campus should be from the wound to the tomb. Okay? So I was taking care of the latter part of life, and he also <laughs> had child daycare and everything in he was very, very innovative. And uh, we even had a liaison uh, develop a relationship with the University of the Third Age, which was over in Toulouse, France, uh, which is a beautiful good concept, and I think it's in existence to this day. But anyway, uh, as Senior Student Program Director, I, had a, I developed an advisory group that was from the, the uh, community college of 12 towns. And there were social workers and there were representatives and I was always in advocacy. Okay, what can we do for these 12 towns? Well, pull the seniors together, pull the resources together. And they started setting up advisory councils to the government, to the local government. That's the way uh, in Connecticut it works. And so they developed senior citizen centers. And then they had developed, and of course, my job being on the community, with the college, I would bring the resources from the college into those, into those centers. So we would negotiate what, you know, like having a, a sociologist talk about sociology, philosophy, um, ancient history. I mean, it was really great. Mm. So I brought those those um, those uh, faculty members into those uh, senior centers, mm. and, uh, and, was, and vice versa. And but but Dan was smart because when the state was thinking, Connecticut's a small state. Okay, we had eleven community colleges. Come on, eleven. <laughs> so whenever the um, that whenever the uh, legislators thought, oh, you know, we got to cut one of them, we got to save money, well, it would always be Esnantuk because Esnantuk was the youngest and the newest. So, guess what? I would go to Tallahassee. That was, excuse me, Tallahassee. I would go to Harford, and we would be in the gallery, and there'd be all these senior citizens up there <laughs> advocating, you don't get rid of Esnantuk <laughs> Community College. And tell me, trust me, they never did, you know, right. not while I was right. there anyway. And I, I know they haven't as of yet. And uh, so it was, but it was a time for the seniors, and it was an ability for our um, our elders to have a, an impact. That's one of the ways that um, you know it was done. So it, and but one of the things going to come, before I, I remarried and I came down here, and as I was getting ready to leave, and I, they were wonderful to me. They gave me a wonderful testimonial, and it was you know all of the college. It was great, but. I heard from the social workers there, Mary, there's something going on in, in the community, and we can't help people. We don't know how to help them. I said, what are you talking about? Because, I mean, here I am, because that's one thing you are when you're in a community college, when you're in a college campus, you're kind of isolated. You're like in a little, you know, you're kind of, you have all these well dynamic, you know, um, very, um, you know, investigative people that never had a chance to go to college. They were coming in, and they were taking advantages of, you know, going and taking courses, and, and then the faculty asked me, could, you know, especially in sociology and other, could we, I have, you know, some representatives from our University of the Third Age, could they, they talk to, and, and we had this ongoing mixture of intergeneration going on all the time. And matter of fact, there was a point there that they wanted, the Connecticut, the system came to me, these 
the community college system said, Mary, can we do your program in two other mm. uh, community colleges? They were trying to ask me to spread out. Mm. That, that was a challenge. That would have been in Hartford and Tunxis, which is in Farmington. Anyway, uh, getting back to this issue, and I said, what are you talking about? And they said, Mary, I can't quite put my finger on it. There's people that are struggling, but I don't know how to help them. And I said, well, you've got to be clear. You know, so by then, I had remarried. I came down to, uh, to Florida, and uh, I moved into, I was in the Boca area. So there was a, there was a notice of, a, uh, of a, having a volunteer corps. They didn't have anything like my job, trust me. As a lot of us professionals that come from up the Northeast, you're going to take a cut and pay. I mean, you, you might as well just settle with, settle right. and acknowledge that. Take it, cut and pay. And also, uh, I didn't. Have, they didn't have anywhere near the kind of position I had up there. So I came, and but I was a volunteer coordinator originally under RSVP, the action. Um, it was a early, early part of my career in gerontology. So I went ahead and I went and for this position for South County Neighborhood Center, which later on has become the Bowling Center. I mean, that's right. This is great and history. So so this, so this, South County, so I became the volunteer coordinator, and Drew Michelle was his, his CEO, executive director. Right. Time. And, uh, I mean, I'm going back here. I love okay? it. I love you it. Know? And so um, I had this uh, volunteers. I had over 100 and something, and um, we were calling people, and, and on the, you know, every day we had this... Uh, reassurance program and um you know we some of the the volunteers would call somebody and say you know france didn't sound right today i said well what do you mean she said well she sounded confused I said, okay confused and so uh i said well what what do you mean by that and so i checked on Frances later on and she seemed to be better and then grace uh was having a problem and 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 rose um was very upset one weekend rose called in all weekend saying that a baby was on her doorstep. And I said, what is going on? You know? mm-hmm. The gentleman walked in, his name was Dick Eckhouse. And he walked in and uh, the office and he said, I want to talk to Mary Barnes. And so I said, I'm Mary Barnes. And he said, and, and there's a, there comes a thing in life, and I don't know if it's ever, it may have happened to you too, Anita, where somebody says something. And, and what he said to me, he says, is um, the, the, the educator from uh, Boca Memorial Hospital he had told him what he wanted to do, and she said, you've got to go down and see Mary Barnes. She, I think she'll be able to help you. And what it was is to start an Alzheimer's chapter. And he says, my wife has Alzheimer's. And she had been very instrumental in the Boca Raton Hospital's volunteer program. She was the leader, and now she had this diagnosis. And when he said the word Alzheimer's, a light bulb went off in my head. A light bulb went off in my head. So I said oh, my God, that's what's going on out there. Mm. So he said he would like, so I volunteer. So I went to June, and I said, you know, this would be a great volunteer program. I said we could have, you know, he gave a donation to uh, South County Neighborhood Center, and he said I would like it to go to starting this uh, volunteer program, and he would pay for the phone. We had a phone, one number, one little blue phone, and I had a volunteer assigned to that phone and would answer it every day. Okay, some different, we did rotation. There'd be a shift in the morning and the afternoon, and, and then I would follow up at night. Mm. Well, Anita, that phone number, that phone never stopped ringing. Wow. Once we put it in the phone book and once we advertised it, we would hear all kinds of stories, and it started eating up more and more of my time, and it came to the point where I had to make a decision mm. because I was, I was at that point on the board of directors. I wasn't a paid, I was a volunteer and I was with all caregivers, but it became increasingly, uh, to me, increasingly uh, a concern and an issue. So I left uh, South County and we started the chapter at that time. And at that time, the uh, chapter's, the mission was easing the burden, finding the cure. The local people would ease the burden, and the national organization found the cure. Well, after a while, they kind of changed their focus, and that's when uh, Mr. Baxter, the Baxter Foundation, uh, Don Baxter um, wanted an organization started to serve local people, 
and he even named it Alzheimer's Community Care. And uh, in, 19, uh, in 1996, we got our, October of 1996, we got our 401, we got our 501c3 uh, number, and um, we opened up in a new building. That's what he built the building for, was for Alzheimer's at 800 North Point Park Way, and that was the beginning of it. Wow, this is a great, you know, I'm so, I'm gonna, of course, we're going to send you this interview, and it's going to be important because you've probably never gone through this whole thing like this, and I love it. It's wonderful, Mary. I, You know, I respect you so much, but I, I haven't really understood where this all came from with you because I met you after you had, well, I don't know, you hadn't even started Baxter. You were still there uh, as a, you know, down in Boca Raton doing your thing and you were so outspoken on Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's. And I mean, I thought, why is she, you know, it's a terrible disease, but what, what caused you to be so, you know, interested in it? And now I see what happened. And, and so this probably could be spoken all the communities all over the country. People did not understand what was happening. And thank goodness you were here in South Florida because probably there were a lot of places that, they just said, oh, remember it used to be senile dementia. Oh, God, yes. Right? Senile yes. dementia. Yep. And That's the doctors, doctors right. That, that was their, they were taught that in medical school, by right. the way. Right, right. In, 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 in those days, because remember, in 1906 is when Dr. Alias Alzheimer's had it under a, a you know, a tele, you know, under a microscope and could see the, uh, the disease itself, the tangles, and from, all the things that they they say happens. It was a, it was a brain tissue right. from a woman who was fifty six years old. They had the study on her, so that's when they made the decision somewhere in the medical community and in in the teaching that if you were under sixty five, you had Alzheimer's if you showed signs of confusion mm. and so change and everything like that. But if you were over sixty five, you were senile. Now. And, and senility really didn't even, it wasn't a medical term, the word dementia. And that was probably the earliest fight that I, that really, that, that the families had because they kept on saying senility. So that meant that there was nothing they could do for you. Uh-huh. I mean, you just had to go home and live with it, and that would be it. And think, by the way, of a nursing home. That was by default because there was nothing else. That's what they would tell them. Now, the nursing homes, you know, unfortunately, um, still have their model, which has not changed for 70 years, 60 years. But don't get me wrong. There are other, now with the insurgent of education and training, and now with, with having people actually, uh, these agencies actually having to learn about Alzheimer's, there is this footprint now within these institutions that... Um, the staff has to the staff has to go to this training. Uh, it, it varies from institution to institution. Like the assisted living facilities probably have the most um, intense training mandate than any other. Uh, Long term care nursing homes they what I think they have to do just four hours and uh, or an hour. I'm not you know there's so many variations because they've got good lobbyists and they've been able to uh, keep that demand down. And so, uh, but they, and I think they only, I think once they go through that training, I don't know if they have to do it anymore after that with their staff. Um, the staff, they just have to go through that one hour training or four hours of training. And if, but where the assisted living people have to go through eight, eight hours initially, and then they have to do a four hour update all the time. So they're really having to learn more. But the problem is in the nursing homes, you know, well, yeah, the, you, the kind of patient you had back in 1985 and, and another, when, when all these models were developed for care, you don't have that patient in there anymore. You have somebody with some form of Alzheimer's, or some form of a neurocognitive disorder. And that's the other part of the advocacy, Anita, is that it's not, the umbrella is not Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is part of other disorders. This is what we're advocating. Neurocognitive disorder is the umbrella. It's not dementia. Dementia is not a disease. Dementia is a symptom. It's like you have a, you have a cough, you know, but the disease could be pneumonia, okay? So, but, but it's, 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 
everybody's fall. A lot of, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of doctors and everybody's fallen into the trap you have to mention. Patients, families come in and say, you know what, my husband doesn't have Alzheimer's, he has dementia. Well, you know, awesome. I have to tell you, this is this could be an hour show. I love it, but I want to get and to tell everybody. <laughs> no, 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 this. no, no. I love this, but I want to make sure that everybody knows who's speaking because I've we've been all been mesmerized by you. Mary Barnes is the CEO of Alzheimer's Community Care, and if you want more information now, she just it's the tip of the iceberg when she spoke, but she didn't tell you about all the wonderful uh, centers that daycare centers that they operate. And let me just give you her phone number. You can call this number if you want to either make a donation, if you want to send, you know, take one of your, or I guess send one of your loved ones there. It's 561-683-2700. 561-683-2700. Or go to alscare.org. That's A-L-Z-C-A-R-E dot org. And, And, the organization is so powerful, and it has so many beautiful attributes to it. Uh, the most important thing, and I know that I know per- people personally who didn't know what to do with a loved one, but they can take them to one of the daycare centers, and it relieves them so they can keep doing what they do every day. And then at night, the, the their loved one comes home. I mean, Mary is Mary told you a lot of history, and I wanted her to do that. Actually, I was probably very selfish about about it because I wanted to know. But Mary Barnes is really a hero here with what well, we call it Alzheimer's, but as you said, a neurocognitive disorder. That's very interesting. And maybe what we need from you, Mary, is I know you have so much time. Um, send me an article for Boomer Times on this reverse of what's happened. I'd I like to that. have that, Mary. I will do that. I will send you... Uh, the, the the American Psychiatric Society has start, has defined this, and they're really going very, very. They're being very, very direct about it. They're being uh, and how they're doing their case identifying in their case uh, management and stuff. So I'll send you the article, and I'll send you what we're doing about it. I would like you to do that, Mary, and it has been so glorious to have you on the radio show this morning and to get up. I see that. The dawn is here. The sunrise is coming up. We're <laughs> looking out at our studio. But, Mary, I, I know that it was uh, very nice of you to get up early this morning to do this, but you have just enlightened so many people, and especially me. Um, well, we, so. we, we are launching another one, too. Um, they lost on foot with the Florida Silver Alert Program. We did the driving one, uh, but now we're launching the lost on foot, which is a lot more critical uh, for this kind of approach with law enforcement. Mary, I'm going to have you back. Mary, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you back again. You you just need to be a regular with us. You're just so good, and we appreciate every bit that you've done. And thank you. Thank well, you so much, Mary, really. Take care. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.